So, one year after George Floyd, can you recall the emotions that you felt when you saw that video? I look, I look back now, as you said, a year ago, and I think of the initial moment of shock, of despair, of exhaustion that in 2020 this type of thing is still happening, something so brazen, something so violent to watch. And that's the initial shock. Uh, and then the next feeling I have is dread, that tomorrow I have to go to work, I have to log in online and speak to colleagues um, who for them it just doesn't hit as hard. And for me to have to continue with my day, continue with my week, when I'm so grounded by this pain and this and this fear for the future and this uh, questioning to the sky, when is this going to end? I really can't speak about how heavy those moments are and how I don't believe I'm the only one who feels that, you know? I look around and I know that other people are feeling this, but we have to keep going. We have to keep working. We have to, you know, get up and do whatever yeah. we have to do. And it's... It's really heavy and really challenging. Yeah. yeah. I remember while you and me were talking about having this conversation, mm. you said something to me that really touched me about. Yeah. You see a black man lying on the ground yeah. with his face shoved in the asphalt mm -hmm. and people looking at it. And for you, that there was a double meaning in that. Yeah. The cheapness of a black man's life. Yeah. Right? Because you never see a white person in that position. No. It's no. always... A black man yeah and if you do see a white person in that type of image it won't be shared on, on social media it's it's not something that people feel comfortable showing each other because they're able to empathize with with a white person if they themselves are white but they sympathize with a black person who's in that pain so they can stomach watching the violence because it's like what witnessing an unfortunate thing but they don't connect to the pain but for a lot of black people they connect, they see themselves in George Floyd, they see themselves in Dante Wright, who was just recently killed. And it's really not that easy to watch. No. And I don't think no. it's necessary. Um, why can't you just read a police report? Why can't you read articles that are written, written about this? Why do we have to spread our message through these horrible, horrible videos? It's, um, it's really, really something I hope to see change. I've seen more and more people on social yeah. media uh, mentioning that this is really traumatic and giving trigger warnings yeah. and trying a little bit, but I'm so tired. You know, I, I, I get it and yet I'm stuck. I'm stuck yeah. because white establishment and white people look at racism as an incident. Yeah. And now seeing graphically the atrocity and the cruelty. Yeah. It brings it home to everyone. Yeah. Like, this is what we're talking about. Yeah. Because for me it was... It was about thinking about the, the stories my grandfather used to tell us about mm. his great-great-grandparents mm. and the mutilation, the rapes, the black man chained in breeding houses, forced mm. to breed their own mothers, their yeah. own sisters, their own yeah. aunts, random women, just mm. because the machine had to go. They needed to produce more babies. Yeah. And if they dared stand up and say no, they would be, the strongest man would be broken down. Yeah. Because that was the way. Yeah. The one that is the strongest mentally, physically, mm. will be broken down in front of everyone to yeah. see. So that you don't dare ever. Made an example. Made an example. Don't you yeah. dare ever think that you have any level of self-esteem mm -hmm. to be able to stand up for your rights, yeah. right? Um, that's what I saw. When yeah. I saw it, that's what I saw. And if I can ask you to sort of put that in the context of the Netherlands, um, because a lot of people where we live, we live here in Amsterdam, a lot of people here will look at that as an American issue, that they have no part in, but also no part in the solution. And how do you see that in terms of the, the Dutch legacy of slavery? How do you connect with people or try and, and, and convince or get through to people um, here in the Netherlands who are not willing to see their role they have to play in their own history? Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a big question. That's yeah. a really big question. Let me start first by saying 
Europe um, is getting a pass. Mm -hmm. Europe is getting a pass because um, uh, America is broadly broadcasting what's happening on the racial front. Mm -hmm. So we are getting a pass here. We're not being as critically looked at because mm -hmm. it's bad in, in the US, right? Mm -hmm. That's one. Second, for the ones that believe that it doesn't happen here, um, it happens here regularly, also in Europe. But the thing with, with Europe is, is that, um, and it's specifically when we look at the Dutch slavery, um, the Dutch role in slavery, is that there is a, a lot of whitewashing has happened in Dutch history. Yeah. If you open Dutch history books, kids are not being taught what happened in Indonesia in Papua New Guinea, no. in Suriname, no. in the north of Brazil, mm. on the Caribbean islands, Curaçao, Aruba, Bonaire, St. Mm. Martin, Seba, when the Dutch owned New York, when the Dutch owned southern parts of the United States. Mm. We don't talk about that, right? We no. don't talk about the fact that more than 30, 40 percent of the slave ships that transported slaves from Africa to the America were Dutch owned. Mm. Our logistical prowess doesn't only come from the fact that we're smart. No. It comes be because we built infrastructure on the backs of slaves mm -hmm. to be able to do this. And um, that whitewashing hurts me. Yeah. It hurts me to see that we have a prime minister that still doesn't want to touch this subject. Doesn't. What you see happening though, because of Black Lives Matter, which I really applaud, is the cities and the provinces are cities saying, we need to do our research, mm -hmm. right? Amsterdam did it and publicly came out and said that they are sorry. We're seeing that Utrecht is doing some research at the moment. Um, I think in Zeeland they're talking about it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't know. People no. don't know. It's really funny that you ask this question. You're asking me, are you, the seven provinces of the Netherlands were autonomous provinces. They owned ships mm -hmm. that they would send to Africa, to the world to get um, ingredients to buy, um, to get slaves to move from one place to the other. And each of these cities owned slave plantations. Now, mm. I want to clarify that because a lot of times people think, oh, they owned buildings and grounds. Mm. They owned human beings. Human beings. The city of Amsterdam owned 30% of Suriname. They owned human beings. Mm. That's what they owned. It wasn't building, it wasn't grounds. Human beings, mm. right? So yeah, yeah. Let, let me. I need to breathe when you ask yeah. me because I can. I can, <laughs> I can imagine, talk about like yeah. for hours. Yeah. For hours. No, no. I, and I and I totally see that. And what's so sort of isolating is if we take it to the question of uh, our dual identities. Um, and if I think in terms of myself, so I'm I'm black. I'm queer. I'm uh, I'm an immigrant. I'm from Uganda, um, and. Uh, I am in my process of learning Dutch, so there's also some language questions uh, where I might not have the best uh, options. But um, when I think of that, I think you are in a situation where when you look around to find someone to address the pain you're feeling, you're limited, you know. And then maybe uh, two months later, there's going to be a homophobic attack in the street. And now you're also animated. And then you look around and the, the amount of allies is also small. You know, it's like we we are always trying to convince smaller and smaller groups of people to support us and uh it's really challenging yeah. and uh i'm so tired really tired is the word of for example um uh trying to convince some people of color yeah. to be more intersectional when it comes to sexuality and gender expressions and gender identity or trying to speak to white queer people about being more intersectional about their race yeah. you know it's we are walking around trying to convince people, and it's tiring. Well, you know, it's it's um, we we created a world in which simplicity yeah. was the motto. Yeah. Black and white, um, uh, winners, losers, mm -hmm. um, 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 scarcity versus abundance. Right. Yeah. Um, we cannot have everyone win. That's no. not possible. Someone no. needs to dominate. So power. Mm -hmm. has a lot to do with this black and white way of looking at the world, mm -hmm. like the spectrum of sexuality, mm -hmm. right? I was brought up, my generation, yes, I'm 25. <laughs> my generation, my generation uh, was brought up with um, the choice between being gay and being masculine and being gay and being feminine, mm -hmm. right? And that's the spectrum I have. Yeah. That's the spectrum I was brought up with in the Caribbean. Yeah. 
um, and now I'm realizing that spectrum is is much wider. It um, is. And yet, in our Caribbean, African Caribbean communities, mm-hmm. it's really hard. Mm-hmm. And and the other thing that we discuss when we're talking with each other is about the the African ancestry. Mm. That in one of your talks you you talked about this, mm. right? In Africa, all the way in the past, before colonization, mm-hmm. before Christianity was shoved down our throats, mm-hmm. right? Two men went living with each other in the villages. No one even talked about it. Hundred percent. It happened, yeah. and it was there. There was no need to label to discuss it, and now slavery, Christianity, getting us out of barbarism Mm -hmm. because we were animals and barbaric. We needed to learn. Mm -hmm. Our history was destroyed. We didn't know anything about it. Yeah, our queer history. Our queer history was destroyed. Nothing written about it. Yeah. And now suddenly being gay is an abomination against God's will and you need to be punished by it and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I think what you're saying is is the best example of how damaging colonialism has been to um, the communities it's affected. If I speak specifically about Africa and Uganda, where I'm from, you know, it wasn't necessarily categorized as being homosexual because that's a word that was imported. The sexuality wasn't imported, but the word, the term was imported. Um, Lots of that was going on. There was a famous king in central Uganda who everyone knew to be gay and uh, Certain people who didn't accept his advances, he used to set them on fire. You know, <laughs> if you think about that level of, of melodrama, that sounds like a, a queer queer present to me. Uh, but um, then it even goes further to gender expression. Yeah. Uh, I think about in Uganda how there's a lot of what, excuse me, what I think I would refer to as witch doctors in English, and witch doctors are not men or women. Those they do not subscribe to being to, men. Or yeah, woman. it's it's like we are imposing this concept of gender that just did not exist organically um, until the Europeans yeah. came, and yeah. it's so exhausting for me when I sometimes go back home to Uganda and people accuse me of you know importing um, homosexuality, importing um, my identity, importing my queerness. But um, the reason why they say it is because they don't know that all yeah, this they don't know that it's right there next door, yeah. next to the tree. So, yeah, it's, crazy. it's really insane. In the conversations we've had, I've gotten to know how strong you've been in your career and all the different steps you've taken um, on the question of diversity inclusion um, and, you know, across, you know, HR in general. I'm curious how you have been able to deal with this duality of being black and queer in the workspace that you've been parts of. Yeah. You know, Professor Kendi, Ibrahim Kendi, in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, talks about the black body and Mm -hmm. how we are chained by what black people feel, how we need to behave Mm -hmm. so that we don't bring the brace down, Mm -hmm. but also how we feel we need to behave towards white people so that racism never comes in, Mm. right? So we are under constant pressure to be perfect. Mm to be the best we can be because your black community wants to make sure that you don't bring them down and the white community, what you want to make sure is they don't exclude you and use racial remarks to push you away. For me, it has been a journey. I was was sleepwalking Mm -hmm. uh, for a long time, working hard, uh, doing my best, and I got far. I got Mm -hmm. really far until I didn't get far anymore. Mm -hmm. And there is something about the um, consciousness of the dominant norm, mm-hmm. what people see as being acceptable behavior, yeah. acceptable quality. Um, and then my eyes opened that mm-hmm. it doesn't matter how good I am, it doesn't matter how much I do my best. There is that little, that there, there is that ceiling yeah. that will stop you. And then for me, it was not a trade off anymore. Mm. I was like, you know something, I'm gonna be me. Yeah. And if you can deal with it, fine. If you yeah. cannot deal with me, that's also fine. Mm-hmm. Um, and it cost me. Mm-hmm. Um, however, just like Maya Angelou said, um, the reward is much greater than the than the than than the cost. Mm-hmm. So in these past 10, 12 years, I've been open gay. Every interview I have is the first thing I say: I'm black mm-hmm. and I'm gay. Um, and uh, this is your chance to, you know, um, 
play the game mm -hmm. and reject me after this interview if mm -hmm. that's not going to work for your organization mm -hmm. and I will totally understand it but I need you to know this because it's not going to go away when mm -hmm. I walked into the door yeah not doing that anymore mm -hmm. I want to bring my full personality to work and thank God I'm seeing progress I don't know if you're seeing progress after after a year after Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. also in the workplace but in our society are you experiencing progress I think Absolutely. And I think it's really important for these movements, for our movement uh, for more and more social justice in our society, it's really important that we recognize our progress, we recognize our successes. I think last year I participated in multiple of the marches here in the Netherlands. It was incredible to see how many people in the middle of a pandemic, so with real, real risks to their lives, wanted to show their voice and support. It was really encouraging. And then that builds on to the most recent uh, election we had here in the Netherlands. Um, and the election of, on the one hand, really sort of scary uh, actors on the far right, but on the other hand, you know, Sylvana Simons, the first black woman head of a political party elected in Europe. You know, this is incredible progress. And we have other, other ways, other intersectional ways. We have the first transgender woman, the first uh, veiled woman um, with a hijab also coming to the, to the Tzveda Kamer. So we've had really positive signals, um, but we need more. I th and I think a big point, if we think on the discussion on Zwarte Piet, that prior to the Black Lives Matter, there was no real majority of people in this country no. who were against it. And now it's a little bit short, but I saw a recent few months ago, I saw a recent poll and it looked like following the results of this very big protest and big march and big movement that it was at about 47% of the country is now in favor of Zwarte Piet. So we have... Of, of getting rid of Zwarte No, no, is, is in favor of keeping it. So 53% wants it gone. Gone, yeah. So we have crossed the majority line. Yeah. And that all is a result of years and years and years of work. Um, and we're getting to see the fruits of it. And that's just... Here in um, the Netherlands, we can look at Kamala Harris, first vice president, um, black female South Asian vice president. And it's not just at the political level. Yeah. I really think at the low, lowest level, there's been a lot more discussion about, wait, so why are these black people so upset? What's going on? Let me yeah. like dig a bit further. Uh, Let me start on the yeah, they can't, Let me educate they, myself. Yeah, they can't it. all be lying. You yeah. know, there's, there's so many of us who are complaining. There must be something there. Yeah. Um, and I feel on a corporate side, on a professional side, we all, even if it's a little bit more, feel a little bit more empowered. And the conversations are happening. And, and they're definitely happening in my workspace, and I'm so proud of the progress they're making there. Um, but more still needs to come. So once we recognize the progress, we don't go and sleep and have a cake and celebrate. No. We have to keep going. Absolutely. But uh, it shows that there is results that comes from our hard work and our hard messaging. But we're not there yet. No, we're not. We're not there We yet. really are not. No. We still have a, have a long way to go. We do. We really do. Yeah. Kevin, thank you for this. this thank you so much. pleasure again. Yeah, thank you. you. And thanks to Corporate Queer, everybody, for organizing yeah. this. I've really enjoyed the conversation.